Hey guys, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor. What's up, Professor? Hey, how's it going? Oh. Hey. <laughs> She's uh, she wants a heat transfer too. What happened? She wants to learn a heat transfer too. Yeah, <laughs> she's been she's been learning vibrations with me. So, um, I actually had a quick question about the homework. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I want I couldn't make it to off hours, but um, so for problem number three, mm -hmm. uh, part B. When we have to solve for uh, LD, mm -hmm. I was just wondering when you're doing the resistance, uh, plugging in for the resistance equations, how do you find the cross-sectional area? Because mm -hmm. I know it's given us L, but it didn't give me any other measurements for that. Right, right. So uh, when you're backing the, the cross-sectional area like this, that's that's usually pretty common for, for these kinds of um, Cartesian problems. Because all of these guys have the same cross-sectional area, uh, so if you remember from the uh, um, from uh, the example that we did in class, uh, the when I gave you the heat transfer, I gave it to you in the form of heat flux, right? And so yeah, heat flux you said is, the is, area. So you said the area uh, in the notes. You said the area cancels out, but does that cancel out for all of it? Yes, it cancels out for all of it because all of these guys will have the same uh, cross-sectional area which is the same cross-sectional area that's being applied for the heat flux too. Uh, and so in okay. this case, in this case, you can just, uh, just um, everything will cancel out. So you don't, you don't need the cross-sectional area. And it's just one heat flux in the beginning, right? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. um, so Q, like Q oven would be like my heat flux? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, I don't need a, Technically, do I need to solve for anything if it's if I'm given the heat flux, or do I still need to do the the Q uh, the heat flux equation like a yeah you, uh, you yeah you still sorry. need to do the uh, the Q equation. So the, your Q equation in this case is going to be Q oven is equal to T zero minus T out all over all of the resistances, right? Uh, oh. and, and so when you do that, um, you'll be able to compute the resistances for um, five of the layers. So you'll be able to compute the resistance for um, layer A, layer B, and layer C, and uh, both the air layers, but you won't be able to compute the resistance for um, layer D. And so when you put that equation together, oh. there will only be just one unknown there, which will be LD. Okay. Um. Okay. So, so then from all the other resistance, I would cancel out the area because right. it would cancel out from the heat flux equation. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then, and then pretty much just uh, basic algebra. Okay, cool. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How was your weekend? Did you watch the Super Bowl? <laughs> I did. It was a uh, kind of a boring game, though. So very boring. Yeah, but I mean, Tom Brady's the the greatest. It's it's crazy to think that he individually has more Super Bowls than every other franchise. I know. It's crazy. Kind of kind of sick of him winning though. Yeah. <laughs> I I used to hate him when he was on the Patriots. I still kind of do, but then. This time, this time was different. This time, I, I kind of was, I was kind of happy for him too at the same time. But yeah, and he's coming back. And he said he's coming back next, uh, next year. So yeah, crazy. It's crazy because he had like a terrible start to the season, and then he did. But he figures out a way. It's interesting because, like, I, I didn't think it would, it would work out because, like, before, like, honestly, before this, I thought it was, it was mostly. Like all their success was mostly due to to, to Bill Belichick. Yeah, so I actually thought like the Patriots were actually going to be um, better off from from this whole thing, but Tom Brady was the one that ended up winning everything, and the Patriots were kind of stinky this year. I mean, Cam Newton is hasn't been good for a while, so yeah, 
Patriots also lost a bunch of the really good defensive players due to like COVID and all that. That's true. That's true. That's true. And then the Bucks have probably one of the most stacked rosters offensively and defensively. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Their defense, their defense embarrassed embarrassed Kansas City. Yeah. I mean, that's the it's the worst game they've ever played. It's the best defense they've ever gone against. Oh man, yeah. it was I was surprised. It looked like it looked like a varsity team playing a junior varsity team. <laughs> yeah, I'm very sad because uh, the Super Bowl commercials have been getting worse and worse. I mean, it's been a strong decline over some time, but it's just horrible. Yeah. It, fe- it felt like most of the commercials were just random celebrities like yeah. advertising just very bland products. Uh, yeah, that's what it seems like. It's been going in that direction. It's just getting getting a celebrity is going to... Well, I remember back in the day, they used to have like really good commercials. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like there's that one commercial in the first half, which it was like for Scott's gardening, like like for fertilizer or something like that. I'm like, okay, this will be a normal commercial. But then they, they had like Martha Stewart, they had uh, Stanley oh, yeah, from the yeah. office. It's like, what are all you guys doing here advertising fertilizer? <laughs> <laughs> that one, yeah, that one was, that one was, uh, and that was like a couple good ones. Like, I think the M&M was, the M&M commercial was pretty funny. That was pretty funny. Professor, yep. Mm-hmm. Will we be going over to homework today? Uh, we'll have some time in the beginning, so where you can ask questions. Yeah. Okay, but if you great. if you want to ask questions now, uh, I'm I'm most, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I was just wondering, like, what the steps are for Part B of Problem Three. Sure. So I was just going to ask on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three B is definitely uh, um, mm-hmm. one of the more challenging ones in this homework. Um, so for three B, um, mm-hmm. you basically you basically have a situation here where you have lots of different layers, right? Um, yeah. And so whenever you have kind of a lots of different layers like this, it's it's best to solve this with the thermal circuit. Um, because what you can do is that for each layer that you have there, so you have layer A, you have the air layer, layer B, air, uh, and then C and D, you can just have one resistance that uh, that captures that whole thing. Um, and that's that's what asks, that's what it asks you to do in part A. Right? And so in part B, um, you're going to you're going to actually use that circuit to um, solve for one of the unknown variables. Okay. Uh, and so you're going to set up the heat transfer equation. So the way um, the way heat transfer works in a circuit is, let's see, let me draw the circuit here. This is not the one from from the homework, but this is just kind of in general, right? Okay. So 
I'll use the same symbols. And so let's say that we have, um, you know, a circuit that looks like this. And on the two ends of the circuit, we have our temperatures, right? And so on the left mm -hmm. side, we have TO. And on the right side, we have T out, right? And so we'll call this R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, okay? So in this case, we have five resistances. So it's, it's one short of what the homework is, right? Mm -hmm. And then what the homework problem also tells you is that you have um, a heat flux that's coming in through um, the entire circuit, right? And so in red right here, we know that we have Q of N. It looks like that, right? And so heat's going from left to right. And so what you do from here is you set up the, um, the heat transfer equation for this, this circuit, right? And so for a circuit, we know that heat transfer rate is equal to the difference in temperatures And so the difference in temperatures in this case is TO minus T out, right? And then you're going to you're going to divide by the total resistance in between TO and T out. And so in this case, I have five resistors. So it would be R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4 plus R5, right? Okay. And so in this, uh, when it's set up like this, um, you know, and you look at everything that's given to you in the problem. You have, um, you're given Q, and so that's good. You're given the two temperatures, and so that's good, right? Um, I give you a ton of material properties in there. So I give you a bunch of the Ks, I give you all the Ks, and I give you um, the H of the air, right? And so with those, you're, you're able to compute most of the resistances, right? And so all of these guys, you can, you can, you can compute them just from the numbers in the, in the problem, right? The only one that you can't compute is just the, the last one, right? So you would basically make the equation for that. Exactly. Right. Okay. And so R5 is going to be L over K. Okay. LD over KE. Okay. And then you're going to solve for that LD because that's the only one there. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. That makes yep. more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in, in, in this case, you have to be careful because it's uh, normally the resistance for a conductor or a, uh, a conductive resistance is L over KA, right? Yeah, I was but, wondering where to get the A because I couldn't see that. Right. So in this case, the A is going to cancel out because remember the, the Q that I gave you here is not heat transfer rate, but it's heat flux, right? And so heat flux mm -hmm. is equal to heat transfer rate over A, right? And so basically what you're going to have is you're going to have an A on this side and then an A is going to factor out from all of these guys and then they're going to cancel out. Um, and so basically, if you're given heat flux in the problem, then you then you can remove A from all of the uh, from all of the resistors. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Not gonna lie, I was scared. You scared the crap out of me. I thought class already started. Oh. <laughs> now we're just shit. now we're just uh, talking about the homework right now. Yeah. Yeah, then I, I realized that I just still for a moment, it's like, oh, shit, I forgot my class already. <laughs> I get, I get an email when you guys join the uh, the Zoom meetings before me, and I think uh, I think Edward joined at like like one forty five or something like that. <laughs> and then whenever that happens, I'm like, oh shoot, did I did I miss the lecture today? But then, uh, yeah. I just had a bunch of time. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to catch you before class started for the I homework see. problem too. I so. Yeah, I, I usually join fifteen minutes before the lecture. So yeah, any any questions like that, I can I can answer before the lecture. Okay, it's uh, two thirty, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone doing today? I'm pretty good. Working good. off a mean hangover right now, but <laughs> Super Bowl party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. I think uh, with with the Super Bowl yesterday, it probably would have been more fun just to drink than just to to watch the game because the game wasn't uh, wasn't the most exciting game in, in the world. But 
Um, yeah, I was with the Chiefs, so it made me drink quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. But you know, hats off to Tom Brady. You know, he really is the uh, the greatest. He has more Super Bowls by himself than any other NFL franchise, which is which is kind of crazy to me. Uh, okay. And so the plan for today is to continue along with our lecture notes on radial heat conduction. So that's lecture notes two. Okay. Uh, we have a homework due tonight. Um, so that's going to be, that was a homework one. And so after you guys turn that in, um, I have another homework ready for you guys that's going to be based on radial heat conduction. Um, and that's going to be due next Wednesday. Okay. So I'll give you guys a little bit over a week to, to do that one. Okay. Um, and so what I have uh, pictured here, so a couple people, a couple people asked um, before the lecture about problem 3B in the homework. And so this, this is kind of the, the setup for it in case you were wondering. So if, if anyone else had any other question, and if anyone else was struggling with that one, um, here's basically how you set it up. So after you draw the circuit, you basically are gonna write down this formula for the heat um, transfer rate at the bottom right here, okay? Um, which is gonna be heat transfer rate is equal to the difference in temperatures divided by the sum of all the resistances. Okay? And with all the numbers that I gave you in the problem, you can plug in for everything here except for the very last resistance. So the very last resistance, normally you would compute that as the length of that uh, of material divided by the thermal conductivity. Uh, but since in this problem you're solving for that LD, what you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're, you're gonna use this equation here to solve for LD because that's, that's the only unknown here, okay? And so the other wrinkle that I have here in this problem um, is that you know, you'll notice in the problem I don't give you a cross-sectional area. Um, but what I do give you the uh, what what I do give you is the heat transfer rate in terms of heat flux, right? So that's why we have a Q double prime right there. Okay, and when you have term, everything in terms of heat flux, if you kind of think back to one of the examples we did last week, you know the area is going to cancel out for all the different terms. So in this case, you know um, you don't need area here because it's it's going to cancel out on both sides of the of the equation. Okay, which is really interesting to to, to think about. So you know. Um, if you kind of think of it like this, like this, this solution doesn't depend on the area. And so you could have like a, an oven that's like kind of, you know, small like this, or you could have an oven that's, you know, gigantic with a huge area and the length that you compute or the thickness is going to be the same in, in either case. So that's, that's also kind of an interesting thing to, uh, to think about. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so that's 3B on the homework. So are there any other questions on the homework um, or just anything else that we covered last week that I can answer before we get started? Uh, just to clarify, you said for that same problem, you're supposed to set it equal to uh, Q oven? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's what this Q here on the left here is. So the Q oven is this this Q. Yeah. Got you. Okay. I see where I went wrong now. And and one and one thing too um, is that you know I, I I gave you guys the answers to the homework problems on the document, but those those aren't perfect. So there's there's a lot there's probably going to be you know more than a few times this semester where I make a mistake on there. So you know if you're doing the problem and you're not getting the same answer as me, you know um, definitely just just let me know. You know if if anything you know more than half the time I, I made a mistake in my own work. So um, but if not, then you know I'm always happy to help you out through the problem too. So you know those those answers there are the answers that I gave you there just are just are meant to give you something to check against, but you know, they, they aren't perfect. So, you know, definitely if you, if you think you're doing it right, but you're not getting my answer, you know, definitely just let me know. And, and I'm always happy to, to work through with you. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead and get started with the lecture today. Okay. All right. So where we left off last week was we, we were talking about um, heat conduction in cylindrical systems, right? And so, you know, basically we have a cylinder and we were looking at problems where the heat transfer either goes from inside out or from outside in, right? And so basically we're just looking at heat transfer in what's called the radial direction, okay? Uh, it's called the radial direction because it's in the same direction as, you know, the arrow that you would use to, to, to denote the radius, okay? And so we did a couple example problems where we solved the, the heat equation in cylindrical coordinates, okay? Um, I have one more example in the notes, um, just because, you know, I, I know cylindrical coordinates can be, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit intimidating. So I, I do have one more example in there, uh, which solves the heat equation under these conditions. Okay. And so it's a, a hollow cylinder. Inside the hollow cylinder, we have a heat flux. Okay. And then on the outside of the cylinder, we have um, heat transfer due to convection. And so if you look at the bottom of page seven on, posted, on the posted lecture notes zero two, uh, you can see me work through this problem, okay? 
but just for the interest of time, um, I'm not I'm not going to go over that one in the lecture today because um, it's kind of more of the same of the uh, more of the same process that we did last week, and I'm going to pick it up today with uh, thermal resist thermal resistances for cylindrical systems. Okay, um, but if you if you want another example to look at for you know the heat equation for cylindrical systems, there's there's that one in there for the notes for you. Okay, okay, and so let's go ahead and talk about uh, thermal resistances. Or thermal circuits, another way to uh, to call it. Okay. And so I think at at one point last time we uh, we used the solution to one of our, our heat equations to define the thermal resistance for a um, for a cylinder, right? Okay. And so that formula was given by the following. So we took the natural logarithm of the ratio of the outer um, radius divided by the inner radius, okay? And then we divide it by two pi times K times L, okay? And that was our thermal resistance, right? And so just to just kind of relate these to a diagram, right? And so when I say L, I mean the length of the cylinder in the axial direction or down the down the barrel of the cylinder, right? R in will be the radius of the of the inner cylinder, okay? And R out will be the radius of the outer cylinder, okay? And just like before, K here is our thermal conductivity. So that's um, remember that's our property that tells us how how well the uh, the property conducts heat, okay? And so just like we, we've done for uh, Cartesian systems, uh, thermal circuits work really well when you have you know, a bunch of different layers of different materials, one after the other, one after the other, okay? So very similar to, um, to problem 3B on the homework, but you know, for, uh, for cylindrical systems as well, okay? And so before I draw that um, diagram, are there, are there any questions here or are people still writing things out? Okay. All right, and so let's say that we have a situation that looks like this. Okay, one more. Okay. And so we let's say that we have uh, three different layers here. Okay. And so we'll call this layer A, we'll call this layer B, and we'll call this layer C. Okay. And they all have, uh, you know, all the radii here are going to be defined. And so we'll call this R1, right? So R1 will be the radius of the very inner cylinder. We'll call this guy R2. We'll call this guy R3. We'll call this guy R4, right? So we have four different radii here. On the inside of the cylinder, let's say that we have, um, you know, heat transfer through to convection. And so let's say that we have a, uh, you know, a temperature, an inner temperature of T infinity I and a, a convection coefficient of H I on the interior, okay? And then on the exterior here, we have more heat transfer due to convection, but with a different temperature and a different convection coefficient, okay? So let's say we have T infinity two and H two, okay? Which we'll call this H one, T one and H one, okay? And so if you wanted to solve this, um, this system with the heat equation, you know, it would be, it'd be really difficult just because you'd have to solve it for basically each of the different layers. You'd have to apply the boundary conditions for each one and it would be just kind of a mess, okay? But instead of, uh, instead of doing that, what we can do is we can set this up as a thermal circuit and that will allow us to solve for the temperatures you know, a lot more easily. And so in this problem, we're going to need five different resistors, okay? So we're gonna need three resistors for each of the different solid layers. So we're gonna need three for um, layer one, or layer A, layer B, and layer C. And we need two resistors for um, the convection, right? So we need one for the inner convection and one for the outer convection, okay? And so our circuit would look like this.
Okay. And so on the interior here, or on the left side, let's make this the first temperature, right? So this will be T infinity one. Okay. And on the right side, let's have this be uh, T infinity two. Okay. And so those are going to be our nodal temperatures. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and label all these resistors here. So on the on our two resistors on the ends are going to be both of the convection uh, resistances, right? So we have R convection one and R convection two, okay? And then on there are three resistances on the interior here will be the resistances from layers A, B, and C. And so let's go ahead and, and uh, write down the formulas for each of these resistances, okay? I'm gonna start with the conduction ones just because we just wrote that equation on the previous page, okay? And so the, the uh, conduction resistance for A is gonna be ln of R2 divided by R1, right? Divided by two pi Ka times L, okay? We use R2 and R1 because those are the outer and inner diameters for layer A, okay? Similarly, we can write the um, expression for RB. And so RB is gonna be ln of R3 divided by R2 divided by two pi KB times L, okay? Um, and so it looks very similar, it's just that, you know, we use the parameters for layer B. So we use R3, R2, and also KB, okay? All right, finally, we can write the, uh, the conduction resistance for layer C. And so this can be ln of R4 divided by R3 divided by 2 pi KCL, okay? Okay. Um, and so those are those are the resistances for for those. So as long as you have all of these geometrical and um, geometrical quantities and also the thermal res, um, thermal conductivity, you can you can just plug these into this equation and then get the thermal resistance. Okay. All right. Any questions on on this? Okay. All right. So now let's write down the the expressions for the convection resistances. And so let's start with the inner convection resistance. Okay? And so this actually has a very similar form to our convection resistance for Cartesian systems, right? And so we're gonna have one divided by H times A, right? Where this A right here, this is our surface area. Surface area that's exposed to the fluid. Uh, and so in this case, you know, we need we need to plug in the expression for the surface area for the inner fluid. Okay. And so, you know, if we go back to our diagram here, you know, for the inner part, we we know that we have fluid that's flowing on the on the inside of this of this tube, right? So it's basically hollow and it's, you know, maybe um, water is maybe flowing on the inside. Okay. And so the surface area of that inner part, we're gonna need to use R1 right here, okay, because R1 is the radius of that um, inner circle. And so this area right here is going to be the perimeter of that inner circle. So it's gonna be two pi R1. And then we're gonna multiply that by the length of the cylinder, okay? Right. And so if we plug that in, then our interior convection resistance is gonna be one over H1, because uh, that's, the, that's the convection coefficient for the inner, um, for the inner fluid, times two pi R1. And so we can do the same thing for the outer convection resistance, okay? So our outer convection resistance can be one over H A, okay? Where again, you know, we, uh, we're gonna plug in an expression for A, which is the surface area, the outer surface area that's exposed to the outer fluid, okay? And so that's gonna be H2 
times two pi. Uh, instead of R1, now we're gonna do R4 times L. And the reason we choose R4 is that R4 is the, is the total outer radius of the, of the cylinder, right? And so the outer fluid, which is flowing on the outside, that's gonna be interacting with just the, with, the, with the total outer surface, okay? And so that surface area there is gonna be two pi R2 times L, okay? Um, R4, sorry. And so now that we have all of the resistances computed, we can go ahead and write an expression for the total um, heat transfer rate. Okay. 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 And so the total heat transfer rate looks like this. We have Q total is equal to. Um, it's gonna be the difference in temperatures in our circuit. And so on the left side of the circuit, we have T infinity one, and on the right side, we have T infinity two, right? Okay. And then on the bottom here, we're gonna sum up all the resistances in our system, okay? And so we have five resistances here. And so let's go ahead and write down all of those expressions. And so our first resistance is gonna be R convection one. And so that's be one over H1 times times two pi, um, two pi R1 L, okay, plus, next we have the convection resistance for layer A, and so that's gonna be LN of R2 divided by R1 divided by two pi K A, L, okay. Next, we have the con uh, conduction resistance for layer B, and so that's going to be LN of R3 divided by R2 divided by 2 pi KB L, okay. Then we have the conduction resistance of layer C, and so that's going to be LN of R4 divided by R3 divided by 2 pi KC L. And then finally, we have the convection resistance of the total outer layer, which is what we have right here. So it's going to be one over H2 times two pi R4 L, okay? And so it looks it looks pretty intimidating, um, you know, because it's 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 a lot of different terms and a lot of things to plug in, you know. But it's but it's it's just a lot of plugging in, right? Uh, and so if you're given, you know, most of the times in these problems, you're going to be given most of these parameters in the problem. Um, so you're going to be given the H's, you're going to be given the K's, um, and all the radii usually, right? And so in those situations, you just kind of plug into this to this equation, okay? And so remember this this was kind of an example here with three different layers. But you know, depending on how many layers that you have, you know, and your exact geometry, you know, this would be um, this would be modified. Okay, but the whole idea with thermal resistances is that you can compute, um, you know, heat transfer rate as a difference in temperature divided by total resistance. Okay. All right. Any questions on on this? Okay. All right, um, so that's so that's thermal resistances for for radial systems. So, <clears throat> you know, the formulas here are are different, obviously, because we're in cylindrical geometries. But the idea is the same. And so, if you know how to do thermal resistances in Cartesian system, you know, all those same ideas will apply to to radial systems as well. Okay, but there is one thing that's that's unique to just um, to radial systems that you don't see this um, in Cartesian systems, and that's the idea of a critical thickness. Okay. Okay. All right. And so to demonstrate that, uh, let me do kind of a, a much simpler example here, where we have just a single layered um, hollowed cylinder. Okay. And so let's say that we have just a cylinder that looks like this. Okay. 
And so since this is a cylinder, this goes into the page. Right. So we're given the, the radii of the cylinder. So the inner radius of the cylinder is going to be R1, and the outer radius is going to be R2. Okay. And then on the outside of the cylinder, we're going to have um, heat transfer due to convection. Okay. And so let's say that it's air, right? So it's air cooled on the outside. And this air has a convection coefficient of H and a, uh, an ambient temperature of T infinity. Okay. Okay. And so we have, we have just basically two resistances here. So we have resistance due to conduction and a resistance due to convection, okay? And so let's write down their equations, right? And so let's write down the resistance due to conduction first. Okay. And so uh, the, the resistance due to conduction is gonna be the natural log of R2 over R1 times two pi K Okay, so let's say that we know the thermal conductivity is K times L, okay? Whereas our convection is gonna be one over two pi H um, R two L, okay? And so it's H times the, uh, times the surface area, okay? Okay. And so now uh, what we're going to do is let's say that we want to make the cylinder bigger uh, by increasing R2. Okay. okay. And so by increasing R2, you know, this, this cylinder is actually going to, is going to grow in size, right? And so let's look at our formulas for our conduction and our convection, and let's see what's going to happen, right? Okay. And so if we increase R2, what is our conduction going to do? Okay. And so if we increase R2, we see that we have ln of R2 in the numerator right here, right? And so even though it's a natural logarithm, when we increase R2 here, our conduction is going to go up. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so let's compare that to what's going to happen when we increase R2 for our convection. Okay. Okay. And so when we increase R2, the convection resistance actually goes down, right? Exactly, right, because the R2 here is in the denominator. And so you have kind of an interesting thing where, you know, when let's say that you have a, a cylinder, right? So let's say that you uh, work for uh, Volcanoes Incorporated and you're in, in charge of transporting lava from the, uh, um, um, from, the, from the volcano, right? And so you would think that, you know, if you have a, a, a pipe that's transporting lava, if you want to, if you want to kind of um, insulate it more, you would increase the thickness, right? And so you would just kind of add more layers onto the, onto the, onto the pipe. Um, but um, just from this, just from this analysis right here, you can see that increasing the radius or increasing the thickness um, actually will decrease one of the thermal resistances, right? And so we actually have um, competing factors here. Okay. Um, you know. And so when you have competing factors, you know, one of, one of which is going to go up while the other one goes down, you know, there's, there's going to be a, uh, um, uh, a sweet spot, okay? And that sweet spot that we're going to find is, is known as the critical thickness. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. And so why, why do we have these competing factors, right? So it's kind of easy to see from the formulas why this is the case, but intuitively or physically, you know, what's, what's going on, right? And so as we increase the thickness, okay, as we increase the thickness of the cylinder, 
you know, we're, um, we're just kind of naturally adding more material um, to the cylinder. And as we add more material, then this causes the amount of conduction resistance to go up. Okay. Right. Guys, remember, conduction is the heat transfer that takes place through a stationary medium, right? And so if we just add more medium or add more stuff to it there's you know it's going to impede more heat transfer right and so if you if you make the analogy to like a, a cartesian case right and so if you want to insulate your room better um you know you you just have a thicker wall right uh, and so the, the basically the more material that you have there the more material that the heat has to go through so that increases your conduction resistance okay and so that's that's actually very consistent with uh, with cartesian um, or planar heat conduction right What's unique about radial heat conduction, and this, this will apply to the sphere as well, is that when you increase the radius, you're also increasing the surface area through which convection will act. Right? Okay. Because uh, the thing with convection is that it, it only takes place on the surface um, of whatever material that you have, right? And so if you increase the, the surface area of that, you're actually decreasing the resistance because you're giving it kind of more avenues for, um, for the heat to, to escape, right? And so you kind of think of this, you know, in terms of a freeway, right? And so, you know, say that you have to get from LAX down to, uh, um, uh, down to downtown LA or something. And so if for some reason, you know, you make the, the 10 freeway longer, you know, um, then it's going to take you longer to get from LAX to whatever your destination is, right? And so that's the same as adding conduction resistance. Um, but, you know, if you add more lanes to the 10 freeway, right, um, that's the same as increasing the surface area, right? And so if you add more lanes, then you're going to get to your destination faster, right? Because there's less traffic, there's going to be less resistance, okay? And so this is kind of the same thing. Okay. And so now that we kind of have the physical intuition, let's go ahead and, and find out, you know, what's the um, critical thickness, okay? And so uh, what I mean by critical thickness is where, at what radius do we have, um, is the um, thermal resi resistance going to be at a minimum, okay? Okay. Um, you can think of the, of the of the critical thickness as the point on which kind of the two um, the two competing factors kind of almost basically cancel each other out. Okay. And so to do that, we can we can use um, calculus here, right? And so whenever we want we want to find the maximum or minimum of a function, all we have to do is take the derivative and set it equal to zero. Okay. And so in this case, our um, our function that we want to take the derivative of is our total resistance, right? And so remember, our total resistance is going to be the sum of our conduction and our convection resistance. Okay, and so our total resistance is going to be ln of r two divided by r one divided by two pi k l plus one over h times two pi r two um, l. Okay, and so let's take the derivative of this guy with respect to the outer radius, so with, um, with respect to R2, okay? And so when we do that, you get the following. And so we have one over two pi K uh, R2 L, right? Um, because we basically just take the derivative of natural logarithm, which is one over that, okay? And, we and then we have minus one over H times two pi R2 squared times L. Okay. 
Uh, and that's the der derivative of the previous function with respect to R2. Okay. Right. And then from here, we can set this to zero and then uh, we can solve for R2. And so luckily for us, you know, a ton of these terms are going to cancel out, right? And so before, before I, I, I solve for it, let's go ahead and cancel out all of the common terms, okay? And so the first thing we see is that we have 2 pi on the denominator here. And so let's multiply both sides by 2 pi, okay? And so we multiply by um, 2 pi on both sides. That's going to cancel out those terms, okay? Uh, we see that there's an L on the denominator on both terms, okay? And so we can also multiply both sides by L as well, okay? And so that cancels out both of those. And then we're left with something that's um, pretty pretty simple, okay? Uh, so before I do that, are there uh, any questions on, on any of this so far? Okay. All right, so after canceling out those terms, what we're left with is one over K R2, minus one over H R2 squared, okay? Equals to zero, okay? And so now we can uh, add um, add this guy to uh, add the second term to the other side, okay? And then what we're left with is one over K R2 is equal to one over H R2 squared, okay? We can then multiply both sides by R2 squared and bring that up here. And we can multiply both sides by um, k, which will bring that up there. Okay. And so we get r2 squared over r2 is equal to k over h. Okay. And then we see that we have r2 cancel on the numerator and the denominator. And so we get the critical thickness. Is equal to the ratio. Of, uh, of the thermal conductivity of the material divided by the convection coefficient, okay? okay. And so you can see it's, it's, it's a very simple result, um, but you know, it's, I think it's very elegant in what it expresses, right? And so basically what it says is that, you know, whatever your critical thickness is, basically it's gonna depend on how well your material itself transfers heat and so that's expressed in the thermal conductivity. And that's going to be divided by how well the fluid um, conducts or convects heat, which is given by H. Okay. And so this ratio here will give you the, the, the minimum thickness or the critical thickness for your uh, for your cylinder. Okay. And so we can uh, we can we can plot this. And so on the x-axis here, let's have R2. And so that's going to be our, um, you know, our outer radius. And on the y-axis here, let's plot the total resistance, OK? And so uh, if you um, actually plot this out, you know, you plug in numbers here. Uh, and this is kind of typical for, uh, for most cylinders. The graph is going to look something like this. And so it's going to go down at first. And then it's going to reach a minimum, and then it's going to start to go up after that. Okay. And then this point right here, where it reaches the minimum, this is going to be R critical right here. Okay. okay. And so this graph is interesting. So you can you can basically um, see that you know when you're starting out with a very thin cylinder, you know actually adding thickness will actually decrease the thermal resistance, right? It's only after you get past the critical resistance that that's when the thermal resistance starts to go up after that. Right. So there's a question in the chat. So to clarify, does K over H minimize the resistance and maximize heat transfer? That's correct. Yeah. And so if you set your outer radius to K over H, then what that will do is that um, your thermal resistance will be at a minimum, and then you're going to have a maximum amount of heat transfer uh, that's occurring in your cylinder. So this concept of um, you know of critical um, radius here or critical thickness 
is unique to radial systems because you have this interplay between both, you know, whenever you increase the thickness, you also increase the surface area, right? And so you don't get that in Cartesian systems because in Cartesian systems, you know, your cross-sectional area, that's usually separate from how thick your material is, right? But in radial systems, they're connected and they're both connected through the, through the radius. Okay. All right, any questions on this before we, uh, we move on to the, to the sphere? Okay, all right. And so now let's start talking about uh, heat transfer in a sphere. And so uh, let me start out by writing the, uh, the heat equation in spherical coordinates, okay? And then while I'm writing this, we'll, uh, I'll talk a bit. Actually, I'm, actually, let me just focus on writing. Right. And so once again, you know, this, uh, this equation here is gonna look very large and intimidating, um, but we're gonna cancel out the vast majority of these terms. Right? And so there's our heat equation in um, spherical coordinates, okay? Okay. And so I think, you know, before, before we kind of embark on, you know, this um, on spherical heat transfer, I think it's fair to ask, you know, how often do we even use a sphere, right? Um, because, you know, a sphere doesn't occur that much in engineering systems, right? Um, if you compare that to a cylinder, like a cylinder, you can kind of see, you know, a lot of pipes for transporting materials, you know, those are, those are cylindrical. But for spheres, you know, there's there's not that many, right? And so, I, you know, I will say that you know you're you're kind of right in the, the, the sphere doesn't happen all too much, right? Um, but you know what you'll uh, what's unique about the sphere is that it has the best ratio of um, of volume to surface area, right? Um, and the reason that's good is that you know remember we what well, we just got done talking about that whenever you have heat loss due to convection that depends on the outer surface area of your, of your material, right? And so the nice thing about a sphere is that if you want to kind of insulate something, um, you know, and prevent kind of heat transfer to the outside, then you actually put it in a spherical geometry, right? And so one thing I'll, I'll, I'll never forget is that I, I went to a, a, a launch site actually, um, you know, um, where they, uh, you know, where they, where they um, you know, launch things for, for rockets, right? Um, and I'll, and I'll always remember that I, next to the, um, near the launch site that they had these gigantic spherical containers. Um, and of course, you know, someone asked like, you know, what's, what's in there. Right. And so what was inside those containers were, was rocket fuel actually. So actually rocket fuel was being fed from those giant containers up to a rocket. Right. And so the reason they used, they chose a spherical geometry here is that that rocket fuel was very, very sensitive to, to temperature. Right. And so they really want to maintain it at a certain temperature. And so instead of storing it in kind of a, uh, uh, in, 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 a in, in like a rectangular box um, or inside a giant cylinder, they chose a sphere because what that will do is that that really minimizes the amount of um, surface area that's exposed to the outside, right? And so because they chose that geometry, you know, they could actually save a lot of money on, you know, how much, um, you know, how much active cooling and how much, you know, active power that they needed to do to maintain that temperature just because of the sphere. And so, you know, for a lot of things, the sphere is not that um, you know, used that much, but for the ones that it, that they are used in, you know, it's it's really really interesting applications like that. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's let's state some assumptions here um, in order to simplify this. Okay. And so the first assumption that we we make is uh, steady state. Just like we uh, we always have, right? 
And due to the steady state assumption, we can go ahead and cancel out this, uh, this term. Okay. And so any derivatives with respect to t, we're just going to, you know, uh, uh, with respect to little t, we're just going to ignore it for now. Okay. All right. And so next assumption that we'll make is that uh, we'll assume that the heat transfer is 1d in radial. And so what this means is that any derivatives with respect to um, the um, polar angle theta and the azimuthal angle um, phi, those are going to be zero. Okay. And so we have d d phi is equal to d d theta, and that's going to be equal to zero. Okay. And so anywhere we see a derivative with respect to that, we're just going to cancel it out, which is nice because that's those are all the really big, you know, scary terms that normally I don't want to deal with. Right. And so we can cancel out both of those terms, you know, um, for that. Right? And so all we're left here with is, you know, a term that has derivatives with respect to R. Okay. Uh, so very similar to our cylinder, and we have our thermal generation. Okay. And sometimes for for a lot of problems, we're going to assume that the generation is going to be zero. Okay. And so sometimes. Okay. We're going to assume no generation. And so no generation means that we just set Q dot is equal to zero, okay? Right. And so that's gonna happen, you know, most, you know, mo maybe 75% of the time, but you know, when it's not, you know, you're gonna have to improve, okay? And so for now, let's, uh, let's assume that that's the case and we're left, and so all we're left with in our heat equation is the following term. Right? So we have one over R squared times DDR uh, where I've changed the derivatives to regular derivatives because we just have one uh, one um, one variable left. Okay. Okay. Times k r squared d t d r is equal to zero. Right. Instead, and so this is all that's left of our heat equation after we applied those assumptions. Okay. And so what what I'm going to do next is an example of uh, solving this. Um, for um, kind of some simple conditions first. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions on on this? Uh, one good question. Yep. Um, if state if there's a if it's generation mm -hmm. or if it does it, then it's just automatically zero. Yeah. Yeah. So usually, if it uh, usually if the problem doesn't say anything, then you can assume that generation is is, is zero. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's do uh, an example. Right, so let's say we have a sphere, um, a hollow sphere. Okay. Uh, where the temperatures are prescribed on the inner and outer surfaces. Okay. Okay. And so it looks like this. Let's say that we have an inner radius Ri with an outer radius Ro. Okay. The inner surface is held at a temperature Ti, and the outer surface is held at a temperature To. Okay. All right. And so in this problem, we're going to make you know all the assumptions that we that we made before. Okay. And so our starting point here is going to be the heat equation, which we just have. Okay. Okay. And so before we actually start integrating, let's go ahead and state our boundary conditions just to be kind of perfectly clear. Okay. All right. So our first boundary condition here is that the, the temperature at the inner radius is going to be Ti, right? So mathematically, we can express this at T as T of Ri is equal to Ti. Okay. Right. And then the boundary condition at the outer edge of this sphere is going to be T at Ro is equal to Ti. Okay. 
Okay. And so now that we've we've set up the problem, we can go ahead and start solving the heat equation. Right? So let's go ahead and start from the form that we had on the previous page. R squared, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, and so here is our starting point. Okay. And so what we need to do now is we uh, we need to um, basically integrate this equation twice in order to solve for T of R, okay? All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take K and we're gonna factor him out. Okay, and so uh, we do that. Then we have k over r squared times d dr of r squared d, d, d t dr. Okay. From here, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides by r squared over k. And so what that'll do is it'll cancel out those terms out in front right there, okay? And then since our right side of the equation is zero, then they just simply just go away, okay? And so what we're left with after that is ddr of r squared dt dr, okay, is equal to zero. And so from here, what we can do is we can integrate once and that'll get rid of the derivative out in front, okay? And so after that, what we're left with is r squared dt dr is equal to c1, right? Because uh, when we integrate zero, we just end up with c1, just like as we have, right? Okay. And so from here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide both sides by r squared and then integrate again. And then once we do that, we'll have an expression for T of R and it'll have our two constants, okay? All right, any questions on, on this before I, uh, I turn the page? Okay. All right, and so once we do that, uh, we are left with DT DR is equal to C1 over R squared, okay? R squared, not R2. Right? And so we can go ahead and integrate this again. And then what we're left with is T of R is equal to minus C1 over R plus C2, okay? Um, and since at this point, you know, we haven't specified a value for C1, we can just kind of absorb that minus one into C1 just so that we're a little bit more convenient, right? And so instead of that negative there, we can just have C1 over R plus C2, okay? And so the only reason we can do this is that remember C1 and C2, you know, we haven't specified their values yet. So we can kind of, until we do that, we can kind of, you know, play with the signs in order to make it more convenient. And so I'm just gonna do this um, first, okay? And so our temperature distribution is gonna have uh, one term, which is one over R, and then another term, which is a constant, okay? All right. And so at this point, we're gonna follow the same process that we've done before, is that in order to solve for C1 and C2, we're going to apply our boundary conditions. Okay, all right. And so first let's apply the boundary condition at Ri, okay? And so we have T of Ri is equal to, um, we're gonna plug in Ri into our um, expression up here. And so we have C1 over Ri plus C2, okay? 
And this is going to be equal to TI. And so similarly, when we, when we apply the condition at RO, well, we get a C1 over RO plus C2 is equal to TO, OK? All right. And so now we have a system of two equations um, and two unknowns, right? And remember, the unknowns that we're solving for are C1 and C2, OK? And so just like we did um, for the cylindrical case, what we can do here is we can subtract these two equations um, to, uh, to eliminate C2. Okay, and so when we subtract these two equations, we can see that C2 cancels out, right? And so we're left with C1 times one over Ri minus one over Ro is equal to Ti minus To, okay? Right. And so we divide both sides by that, uh, the term in the brackets, then we can get an expression for, for C1. Any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. And so if we perform that division, what we get is C1 is equal to TI minus TO all divided by one over RI minus one over R. And so now that we have C1, we go ahead and plug this back in and solve for C2. Okay. okay. And so you can choose either, either of the equations, but I'm gonna go with the, um, the I equations for the interior one, okay? And so uh, with that, we have one over Ri times C1 And so I just, all I did was I plugged in C1 back into the first boundary condition, okay? And so now the only unknown here is C2, okay? And so if we solve this equation for C2, what we get is Ti minus one over Ri times Ti minus To, all divided by one over Ri minus one over R. Okay. And now that we have um, all of these terms, um, C1 and C2, we can plug this back in and, um, you know, express the, the total temperature distribution. And so we just plug in for C1, C2, what we get is T of R is equal to one over R times C1, okay? And so this is gonna be Ti minus TO all divided by one over Ri minus one over RO, okay? Plus C2, where C2 is right here, so we have C2 is Ti minus one over Ri times Ti minus To divided by one over Ri minus one over Ro, okay? Right. And so a little bit of a mess, um, but you know, it's, uh, you can see we're, we're following kind of the same process um, that we've done before, okay? 
Okay. Any questions on, on how we got here? Okay. All right. And so if, if you compare this answer to the one um, that's in the book, you know, the book um, has it a little bit different because they, what they've done is they've, they've rearranged these terms using some algebra, okay? And so let me give you the expression that's given in the book um, and, you know, just to, just to kind of um, assure you that these guys are the same, okay? And so if you do a little bit of, of rearrangement and a little bit of um, algebraic gymnastics, um, you get the following equation. Okay. Right. So both of these guys, both of these guys are valid here, but it's, uh, um, you know, um, that's just kind of what the book, um, what the book shows. Okay. Okay. So this right here is the book answer. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so that's our temperature distribution. And just like we did with the cylinder, let's go ahead and compute the uh, heat transfer rate using Fourier's law. Okay. And so Fourier's law. Oh, question. So which one do you recommend that we use? So, uh, and so, you know, typically for heat, um, um, heat equation problems, you know, you're going to be solving the heat equation from, from scratch. And so, you know, uh, which answer you end up with is, is really going to depend on the boundary conditions, right? And so, you know, uh, I'm not going to ask, I'm, I'm probably not going to ask you to solve for, you know, the heat equation um, for, you know, two prescribed temperatures, because, you know, we just did that. Um, and so what's kind of more important um, in the previous example was kind of the process through which we, um, we got that answer. Yeah. Um, and so the only reason I have this one here is that, you know, uh, if you look in the book, you know, they, they, sh they showed a bit different. And I think in the book, they kind of skip a lot of the steps too. So, you know, I wanted to show you the process through which, you know, we, we derived the solution, um, but I also wanted to give you what they showed you in the book in case, you know, you, you do some cross-reference. Okay. okay. And so the heat transfer rate through Fourier's law is gonna be uh, QR is equal to minus K times A times um, DT DR, okay? Uh, and so, you know, for a sphere, you know, we can plug in the area for a sphere, which is the cross section, which is the, uh, the surface area, right? And so the surface area for the sphere is going to be 4 pi um, r squared, right? And then for uh, dt dr, we, we need to take the derivative of this expression up here, okay? Okay. And so uh, when you um, do that, you end up with the following. And so you have QR is equal to uh, minus K times four pi R squared. Okay. The, the derivative of the upper expression here is given by one over R squared, right? And so we have a one over R squared because we have a one over R um, in our original equation, okay? And then to that, we're gonna multiply by TI minus TO all divided by one over Ri minus one over Ro, okay? And so you can see these two radii cancel out, okay? And then what we can do here is we can have um, an expression for the thermal resistance, okay? Oh yeah, these, uh, these negatives here will cancel out as well, okay? Okay, any questions on, on this?
Okay. All right. And so uh, if we um, cancel out those terms, we have QR is equal to 4 pi K times TI minus TO, okay, divided by uh, 1 over RI minus 1 over RO. And so if we factor out ti minus to, what we have is 4 pi k divided by 1 over ri minus 1 over ro times ti minus to, OK? And so when we put it like this, you can see that this expression right here, this is our, uh, this is 1 over the thermal resistance for the sphere. And so if you write um, out that term, we have the following expression, okay? And so the thermal resistance for a sphere is gonna be one over Ri minus one over Ro divided by four pi K, all right? Isn't and that so, a QR prime? Um, QR prime. This this should be just the uh, um, just the heat transfer rate, and so it's uh, it's it's not the heat flux. Um, but notationally, so it's not it's definitely not QR double prime. But I think probably in the book sometimes they use a prime here to denote just just heat transfer rate. But I, I usually do it without the prime because it's uh, um, there's no there's no length here, so it's just uh, energy over time. Oh, I see. Because you were taking the derivative of temperature. I thought we were taking the derivative of Q. That's oh, yes. Me off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're taking derivative of temperature. Yeah, not of not of Q. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so with this thermal resistance right here, you can you can start to do problems with compound layers of, of spheres, right? And so let's say that we have you know um, a sphere with multiple different layers, right? And so let's say that, you know, um, you know, just like in Shrek, let's say that we have an onion with lots of different layers, right? And so you can use a, this, this idea of a thermal resistance for a sphere to find heat transfer in an onion if you, if you really want to. Right? Okay, uh, any questions on, on this? Okay, so I do wanna do one more example here um, for a solid sphere, right? So this is kind of this kind of mirrors what we did for the cylinder, right? So for a cylinder, we did a solid cylinder. And if you remember uh, from what we um, talked about last Wednesday, we had to do something a little bit special for the for one of the boundary conditions, right? And so with the sphere, it's going to be the same thing. So we're, we're going to have to apply what's called a symmetry boundary condition uh, to basically make sure that our temperature doesn't go to infinity, okay? And so let's say that we have a solid sphere. Okay. Um, and just to kind of you know uh, give you guys a, a little bit of a different look, let's say that this sphere also has thermal generation. Okay. So we have a sphere like this. We're going to assume now that we have k uh, q dot, okay. And then on the outside of the sphere, let's say that it's cooled by convection. Okay, okay so we have t infinity and h. Okay? And so, um, you know, we're we're going to apply most of the same assumptions that we did before. So we're going to assume steady state. We're going to assume that the heat uh, heat flow is one d in radial. Uh, but now we're not going to we're not going to cancel out the thermal generation. Okay. All right. And 
so let's write down our boundary conditions um, so that we can uh, use that to solve for our constants later, okay? All right, so the first boundary condition is we have convection heat transfer at the exterior, okay? And so we're gonna have minus K, A, DT, DR at R is equal to, uh, what's the radius here? Let's call this RO. And so the conduction heat transfer at the outer cylinder, I mean, at the, out, at, the, um, at the outer surface of the sphere has to equal to the convection heat transfer at that surface as well, right? So this is gonna be HA times T infinity minus T at RO, okay? Right, so the A's are gonna cancel out. And then what we're left with is that expression there, okay? And so that's that's the only kind of um, you know visible boundary condition that we have, uh, but we know that since we have a solid sphere, you know we have to apply kind of our hidden boundary condition, which states that our um, our temperature profile has to be symmetric. And so remember that symmetry boundary condition states that the, the derivative of temperature um, with respect to R evaluated at R is equal to zero, that has to be zero, okay? So that tells us that once when we're in the middle of the sphere, we're either at a maximum or a minimum, okay? Okay, uh, any questions on the, on the problem setup? Okay, all right. And so let's go ahead and start solving our heat equation. So in this case, we're gonna start from a different point. And so we're gonna start um, from the heat equation with thermal generation, okay? And so we have one over R squared times K R squared DT DR. Sorry, there's a DDR out here. Okay, can't forget that. Plus Q dot is equal to zero. Okay. All right. And so what we're going to do first is we, we need to isolate the derivative term um, on its own. And so we're going to subtract Q dot from both sides and then um, multiply by um, R squared over K. Okay. And so we do that, we're left with D, DR of R squared DT DR, okay, is equal to minus Q dot uh, R squared all over K, okay? And so remember, once again, once, uh, you know, I assume that K was constant, so I pulled it out of the derivative, okay? Now that we're at this point, we can go ahead and integrate. Okay. And so when we integrate, we're left with R squared DT DR is equal to um, minus Q dot, over 3k r cubed plus c1, okay? And so let's simplify this a little bit. Let's divide by r squared. Okay. And then that will, uh, that will go ahead and simplify this, okay? All right, any questions on this before I, uh, I turn the page? Okay. One question. Yeah, what's up? For the, uh, when you integrate R squared, it's R cubed or not R first? Because I think before you did like a R first in one of the previous problems when you integrate. Right, right. So I, I did an R first in that case because it was one over R squared. And so when you integrate oh, one over oops. R squared, it becomes one over R to the first. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. All 
Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and divide by r squared. And so we're left with dt dr is equal to minus q dot over k, 3k times r plus um, c1 over r squared. Okay. All right. And so before moving forwards, uh, let's go ahead and apply uh, one of our boundary conditions, okay? Um, because we, we have this in terms of dtdr here. So it's, it's kind of in a nice form, right? And so you, don't, you actually don't have to, um, you know, take it all the way to the end, you know, or and integrate if you can apply one of the boundary conditions from here. And so let's apply our symmetry boundary condition. And so remember, our symmetry boundary condition states that dt dr at r is equal to 0 has to be equal to 0, OK? And so let's take the expression that I have at the top here and plug in little r is equal to 0, OK? So we have minus q dot over 3k times 0 plus c1 over 0 squared, OK? And so since we have something times zero, this first term is going to go away, OK? And then after that, we're left with our um, mathematical paradox, right? And so we have c1 over 0 squared, which you know is impossible, right? And so to kind of resolve this and to make sure that you know um, we don't break any laws of physics, what we need to do is we need to set c1 to 0, because we, we basically need to make sure that this, this term here doesn't exist. Okay, and so just to make sure that we have a mathematically consistent answer, we can go ahead and set just C1 is equal to zero, okay? Okay, and so that cancels out this, and then what we're left with is dt dr is equal to minus q dot over 3k times r. Now that we've eliminated C1, we can go ahead and integrate one more time, right? And then when we integrate one more time, what we get is T of R is equal to minus Q dot over 6K times R squared plus C2. Okay. Okay. And so from here, we can go ahead and apply our convection boundary condition. Okay. Right. Uh, any questions on that before we, uh, we start with that? Okay. All right. And so our convection boundary condition look like this. We have minus K dt dr at r is equal to r0. This has to be equal to h times t infinity minus t of r0. OK. And so let's go ahead and plug in our expressions here. So on the left-hand side, we have minus k times dt dr at r0. right? And so dt dr at r0 is going to be q dot over 3k times r0, okay? And this is equal to h times uh, t infinity minus um, t at r0. So this is going to be plus q dot over 6k r0 squared minus c2, okay? All right. And so just we're just since we're out of time here, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and skip to the end, right? Right. So we can see here that the uh, that the k's are going to cancel out, and we can solve this for c two. Okay. And what we get is c two is equal to t infinity plus q dot 
over 6k r0 squared minus q dot over 3k r0. Okay. And so we plug all that in, then what we get is our final answer is t of r is equal to q dot over 6k r0 squared minus r squared, okay, minus q dot over 3k r0 plus t infinity. Okay. Okay. Any final questions on, on that? So when you apply the symmetry condition, does that just show that C1 has to be zero to make sense in, in real life? Yeah, yeah. So it is it's it is kind of a, a strange condition just because it, it doesn't work out nicely mathematically, but it's uh, um, that's that's basically kind of the, the result is that, you know, you can't, your solution can't depend on one over R squared because um, otherwise, you know, um, then you would have infinity temperature at the middle. So whenever you have a solid cylinder or a solid sphere, you have kind of weird stuff um, that happens like that. Okay. All right. Uh, so there's no more questions. Uh, that's all we got time for today. So I, I apologize for running over, uh, you know, a little bit. And so what we'll do on Wednesday is I'll do a very quick example to show you how to do thermal circuits in spheres. And then we're going to move on to our next set of lecture notes, which is on fins. Okay. All right, so thank you, thank you guys for tuning in today. Um, have a good rest of your day, and I'll see you guys on, on Wednesday. Thanks, Professor. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you, Professor. Thanks, everybody. Daniel, uh, Daryl, did you um, have any more questions? Okay, uh, so if you guys don't have any more questions, I'm, go I'm gonna go ahead and close the call.